Major funding for Questioning the Constitution was provided by Paul and Victoria Saunders and by J. Thornton Kirby. Questioning the Constitution was produced in collaboration with the University of Virginia's Center for Politics. It's looked at as the gold standard by not only, you know, people here who, who bother to take a look at the Constitution, but also by people throughout the world who are trying to get their, their governments in place. It doesn't take very long to read the Constitution. I mean, you know, any of your viewers, I mean, look, there it is. That's not a very big thing to go ahead and read. It's all in there. People in power will not protect our democracy for us. They have power. They like power. Democrats want to get their way. Republicans want to get their way. People have to push back and remind people of what these constitutional principles are. I think there are things that should change when, when I look at the Constitution. Uh, and I think there are things the Constitution should put in place. I think probably it's time to revisit the Constitution. Jefferson said very appropriately, a little revolution now and then is a good thing. And indeed it is. It applies as much to our time as it did to his. It has laid the cornerstone to be, and I repeat, the oldest continuously functioning democratic republic on earth today. All others have gone into the dustbin of history. Don't tinker with it. The Constitution, in a sense, provides the conscience of America. And what that means is that the Constitution has these values about how we live together as Americans. We respect our institutions. We tolerate these opposing views, even though we fight like crazy for them. We don't feel that it's always winner take all. You know, it's easy for us to just say, I want my way, I want my way, you know, I want to get this in the budget, I want this, I want my way on immigration, I want my way on gay marriage, I want my way on this, I want it on this. It's hard to remember that there are other people in America who don't share that view, and that the Constitution doesn't say, I the people, it says, we the people. I think the Constitution, on the whole, is, is, is a marvelous document, and uh, it achieved what the framers set out to achieve at the time, which was to create a country strong enough not to be reconquered by the European powers, and that was really what was on their minds. Their constitution, however, was marred by really, really unconscionable compromises, which they knew at the time were not right. We still labor under some of the effects of those uh, unforgivable compromises, and we, we need to address it. Our constitution goes off the rails much more often than people realize um, because they have been taught that it's perfect. And God knows it isn't that. When I think of the Constitution and what it means to me, I gotta back up a little bit because if you look at the preamble, it says, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. And it begs the question, who are we the people? It wasn't we the people Native Americans at that point that the Constitution was written. But I've never lost the dream or the hope, and I've begun to see the reality that the Constitution does apply to me. I can go into public restaurants and have a meal. I can go into public libraries and check out a book. Those things are very near and dear to me because in my early years, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go into public restaurants. Uh, I remember going to Oklahoma as a kid to see my brothers graduate from college. And we went to this, this uh, service station and I had to go to the bathroom. And, and, and the bathrooms were labeled white and colored. I said, Dad, where do I go? I said, there's no place for me to go. And I was like six years old. Of course, he said, son, come with me. And he fixed it. But the bottom line is at that point in time, I was denied some basic rights that the other people took for granted. So the Constitution, I love it as it becomes more actualized. I see my place and I, I defend it.
When it really hit me, probably what the Constitution really meant to me personally was when I it came to West Point. I am walking where people like Grant and Eisenhower and MacArthur have walked. And here am I, you know, uh, a little uh, Hispanic girl from New York City, taking the oath to support and defend the Constitution. It is an empowering thing to take upon ourselves, each one as, as citizens in the military, as civilians, this enormous responsibility that the Constitution places on all of us because it comes from this idea that the government is, is of the people, by the people, for the people. In 1787, I'm told our founding fathers did agree to write a list of principles for keeping people free. When I was a kid, there was a children's show that sang the Constitution. Schoolhouse Rocks, that's right. It, it, it's phenomenal uh, and that, how that left an imprint still to this day. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. I love it. It's good stuff. But I think the times we live in now, where there's so much going on and there's so much hankering to change the Constitution, to do this to the Constitution, I think people need to fundamentally understand and appreciate it for what it is as it is. United States of America. How many times have I referred to this magnificent instrument, which I often think it was it's almost by divine providence that these men gathered together in that hot constitutional convention and worked on it those period of time. And you know what Franklin said when he walked out, and a press person asked him, what have you wrought? And he said, a document, a republic, if you can keep it. And that's been tested many times, and we've kept it. No, I think our Constitution has stood the test of time. I think we are the envy of other nations. Many countries have followed basically our Constitution. The three separate branches, I think, are pretty well clearly defined. And they're co-equal. And uh, the checks and balances sometimes, I think, uh, there are more checks than balances because the way the Constitution is drafted, you know, things proceed very slowly in government. Maybe that was the intent of the drafters, but sometimes things never seem to get done. People often say it would be wrong to change what the founders did. They need to go back and read what the founders said. Uh, they were pretty consistent about expecting us to have regular constitutional conventions. They wanted each generation to reconsider what they had done. Thomas Jefferson maybe was the most radical in uh, suggesting that there ought to be a new constitution every generation, 19 years in his time. Uh, we certainly don't need uh, a constitutional convention every 19 years. I think it's perfectly reasonable to have a constitutional convention in the first decade of every new century. Even if we changed not a word, it would be a marvelous opportunity for civic education. People would learn about the Constitution. The Constitution serves more than one purpose. At the most simple and technical level, it is a set of instructions to those who hold government power. It's in the preamble that the framers have spelled out the lofty purposes of government, uh, the general welfare, the common defense, and other purposes like that. I think if you linger over that language, then you begin to see what the philosophical or policy assumptions are that underlie the whole federal enterprise. So you begin with preamble, and then as you move through the body of the document, it's actually fairly logically organized. Article 1 is the legislative article. That's the article that essentially establishes Congress, says what Congress's powers may be. So Article 1, quite simply, is the legislative branch. Article 2 is the executive branch, provides for the presidency, essentially to provide for the execution of the laws. There is some debate over whether there is inherent power in the presidency, but it does make him commander-in-chief, as well as being the chief executive officer. 
Article 3 is the article that provides for the judicial system. It, it says there shall be a Supreme Court. And finally, as you move towards the latter part of the Constitution, you begin to get to things like supremacy and change. You look to the future, in effect. So you start with the statement of purpose, the preamble, you set up the three branches of government, you flesh out the federal system, and you look to the future. Of course, it contains lots of complicated implications. I mean, interpreting it, applying it, making it work uh, creates volumes of constitutional law. I mean, this is tradition, you know? It's just like... It's the little things. It's the little things at, at VMI. That, things that the courts can't see. That, yeah, yeah. That people can't see. If women come here, it'll be like... You know, it'll be like, what they want. yeah, it's because the, the way it is now, it's because it's all male. And as soon as they come here, it'll change. So they still won't be gaining anything. We actually do teach the case involving VMI. It's, it's U.S. versus Virginia. And it talks about these stereotypes that were pretty much in, enshrined in some ways in the law and the way cases were being decided, that men had a certain sphere where they were going to be active in and that they were capable in, and then women had another more limited sphere. And it wasn't in, in the same sphere which would allow women to be leaders, women to go into the military, women to contribute as well as men do. In the VMI case, it was the Department of Justice that was suing the state of Virginia on behalf of all the citizens of, of Virginia, and particularly uh, those young women who wished to avail themselves of the educational opportunities at Virginia Military Institute, which was a state institution. The VMI case was an opportunity for uh, actually Justice Ginsburg, who had been one of the champions of women's rights in the 70s, and case by case as an advocate, litigating in front of the Supreme Court. Now she was on the Supreme Court, so she was able to write the majority opinion there. And so that's just one of those examples where a very difficult and controversial at the time decision is made. Now we can say whether we agree with the decision or not, or whether we d agree with the rationale or not, but as Americans we all agree the process is that the courts will determine that and that the Supreme Court will be the ultimate arbiter of what a phrase in the Constitution means. Prior to the Constitution, we had a country in disarray. Our foreign predators were hanging out, waiting for us to fall apart. France, England, Spain, it was insanity. Washington, Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson all bemoaned the possibility of maintaining a nation. The Constitutional Convention is a model of compromise. And these were people as diverse, relatively speaking, as we are now. They came from different religions which actually had meaning. They came from states that were as distant and different as nations are today. And they did not like each other. But they understood the great need to create the we, so they made many compromises. You have to imagine when the framers were working on the what became our Constitution, the challenge that they were confronted, frankly didn't yet know what a Constitution ought to look like. How do we write this Constitution, give the government the powers that it needs, that we think it needs to make America a, a great nation, but at the same time quiet the doubts and fears of people who said, no, that much power is bound to be tyrannical. James Madison was certainly one of the key figures. He came up with a plan and took that with him to Philadelphia. Many parts of Madison's plan were not finally adopted, but Madison had the political sense, the tactical sense to realize that he would have to make some compromises, and the main thing was to come out of the convention with a plan that worked. He proposed and wanted representation in the Congress to be based on population. The more people in a state, the higher their representation in Congress. Other people in Philadelphia, in particular from the small states, were worried that the big states like Massachusetts and Virginia and New York would basically swallow up the rest of them and they would be outvoted, outnumbered, and therefore uh, they would be threatened by that kind of arrangement. So the counterproposal of Philadelphia was essentially a plan that would have given each state equal representation. 
The middle ground, in a sense, was fairly obvious that we'll, we'll split the difference. We'll have the House of Representatives based on population. We'll have the Senate based on states' equalities, and therefore both the people and the states will somehow both be represented in the uh, legislative process. On the executive, that again was a compromise. They weren't willing to go as far as to have a popularly elected president. This was not the mindset of 18th century framers. But they also thought they should not have the president elected by, let's say, the Senate or by Congress, because that would make the executive dependent upon the legislative branch. And that would not be a sufficient separation of powers. As the convention moved along, they finally came up with what we know as the Electoral College, a very cumbersome and awkward kind of arrangement. It actually made more sense at the time because smaller country, leadership knew each other, and they certainly knew that the Electoral College would get together, and they knew who the first president would be. It was going to be George Washington. Well, that worked all right for a time or two, but as we know today, it's, it's a little bit hard to explain or justify. One of the key compromises made in Philadelphia was to build in certain protections for slavery. What they realized is that you couldn't have a constitution in the first place unless you appeased the minority of well-placed slaveholders. The southern states wanted to have power in Congress proportionate to their population. And they at first said, we should get representation for all our slaves, as well as free people. Well, the northern states said, no, absolutely not. I mean, what is, well, what's the deal? Are they property or are they people? You can't have it both ways. But they made it clear they were going to walk out. Isn't it remarkable, knowing what we now know about the American history, the problem of slavery, sectionalism, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Slavery is still with us in the civil rights movement of the, of the 20th century and the problems today of it may not be slavery as such, but we still have the lingering problems of race. Given all that American history, isn't it remarkable that when you read the Constitution, the word slavery never appears? The Constitution seems not to talk about slaves. Framers of the Constitution agreed to what is called the Three-Fifths Compromise, namely that in deciding the basis of representation in the House of Representatives, that you would count not only free population, but three-fifths of other persons, other persons being a euphemism for slaves. So the southern states wanted slaves to be counted one-on-one -on -one to swell their population. Uh, northern states would have preferred that slaves not be counted at all. And so finally they just, in effect, came up with this three-fifths compromise. So that the text of the Constitution talks about three-fifths of other persons. That, of course, is now uh, a moot point. I mean, that language no longer has any legal effect because of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But it's still in there. Now we are reaching out for the daybreak of freedom and justice and equality. In the Civil Rights Movement, there's a great moment. It's uh, December 5th, 1955. The first meeting of the Montgomery Improvement Association is being held. This is the beginning of the bus boycott. Rosa Parks been arrested four days earlier. Uh, people have stayed off the buses for one day. Now thousands of them are gathered in a church in Montgomery, uh, and so many that thousands are standing on the street outside listening to this on loudspeaker. And this new young minister in town, Martin Luther King, who most of them don't know, never heard of, don't know anything at all about him, has been chosen the leader of this group, and he has to give the reasons why we're here and in a relatively brief speech maybe 20 25 minutes he says something that's just so powerful he says we're not wrong because if we are wrong 
the Supreme Court is wrong. And in 1955, no black people think the Supreme Court is wrong. And the year before it is just ruled against segregated schools, how could that be wrong? Then he says, if we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. And nobody then or now thinks the Constitution is really wrong. And then he says, if we're wrong, then Jesus Christ is wrong. Of course, when you're speaking in the whole Street Baptist Church, there's nobody there who thinks Jesus Christ is or ever could be wrong. But it's this endorsement of the Constitution, this embrace of the Constitution that, not all, that King articulates, but that everyone in the room, no matter how unlettered they may be, embraces with him. And we are not wrong. We are not wrong in what we are doing. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. He knew from that basic American understanding of it that this is the document that says I'm a person. And as a person, I have all the rights every other person has, no more, no less. And the fact that I now have less means that I've got to use this document to make sure I have an equal amount. It took a long time for the country to come to a consciousness that we've been treating a portion of our population badly. We've denied them the right to vote, we've denied them the ordinary protections of police, we've denied them just elemental, basic human rights, and we've treated them awfully. A movement arose, and the movement eventually won the hearts and minds of the American people and the hearts and minds of the Congress of the United States, and because of a courageous President, Lyndon Johnson, helped set right what had been wrong for a hundred years. Now, along the way, there are many, many victories, court victories uh, won by the NAACP and other organizations, and these court victories depended on forging a new interpretation of the Constitution and new enforcement of what the Constitution said. So the 1960s is when all of what has been wrong is set right. delegates at Philadelphia were, on the one hand, I think statesmen, they understood the needs of the nation, but they also had to take the package back to their respective states and sell it. And the states were required to ratify the Constitution if it was going to go into effect. The Philadelphia Convention didn't provide for a Bill of Rights. The so-called anti-federalists, those who were opposed to the new Constitution who thought it dangerous and tyrannical, seized on the issue of the lack of a Bill of Rights. Madison and the other proponents of ratification were obliged to agree, look, just let's ratify the Constitution and we will undertake to add a Bill of Rights. It was a very close call. I mean, Virginia and New York nearly defeated it. If Virginia and New York had not ratified, they would be obliged to go back to the drafting board and it's not at all clear that a second time around they could have actually brought a constitution into being. So the states did ratify and at the first Congress, Madison as a member of that Congress was as good as his word. He undertook to see that a Bill of Rights was proposed. Of course those were amendments that had to be in, also ratified by the states, but they were. So that's how the Bill of Rights came into being. And we, we simply take them for granted as surely they must have been there from the start. Constitution and constitutional law ought to be given in every high school in the United States. And I mean that. Uh, I made that point during the Watergate hearings when we have all these officers of the United States government, military and civilian stand up there that had gone ahead and flouted the Constitution in every which way. And I asked them, do you ever read the Constitution? Do you have a course that no. Well, I'm here of men that raise, and women that raise their right hand swearing to uphold the Constitution, which they've never read. <laughs>
So the answer is that's an enormously important part of anything that we do for the future, is teach our young people the Constitution. Most people out there don't have the foggiest idea what it's all about. You cannot write a law that's going to stop any sort of illegal behavior. You might make it more difficult, but people who want to misbehave are going to misbehave. It's up to those that are responsible for oversight, for enforcing the law to do that. And that was a great test. Had Richard Nixon succeeded and the committee that Senate and House failed, we would have been in a pretty sad state of affairs here in the United States. We made a conscious decision that our politics wasn't going to sink to his level and we weren't going to allow him to trample the Constitution. The whole thing was about presidential power and going ahead and not allowing him to, to exceed his powers. Issue after issue that was raised, whether it was the break-ins or the spying or the language of the president himself and the orders of the president, the disregard of justice, I mean, just flew in the face of the entire Constitution of the United States. And it was in that broad sense, really, that Richard Nixon was condemned, never mind any specific act. And that's what it ended up being, was the condemnation, because, of course, he escaped impeachment. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. What did we learn? I don't think we learned very much, and we were right back at the same old stand, whether it's Mr. Reagan and Iran Contra, or whether it was the recent actions of George W. Bush. Look, it requires constant vigilance. This thing does not carry itself. It's for us, and it's for us to go ahead and keep it as it was intended. One of the most important duties you have is to first, I think, understand the documents that gives you the rights that you claim you need, that you want that you're entitled to, uh, and understand why that is and how that comes about. Yeah, it's a great process, I think. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of old-fashioned that way. I'm just, you know, I just, it works. Why do you, why do you want to change it? It works. Yeah, I'm sure there are decisions in there that the Supreme Court will interpret, and in my view, misread in the Constitution, for example, with respect to Roe versus Wade. This whole privacy right does not exist in my view in the Constitution. That's the, the upside of it, is that you get to go back and forth. And over time, uh, those hot issues, you know, Roe versus Wade from 73, will get worked out. Here we are some 35 plus years later. Um, and people's attitudes and perceptions have changed and are changing. That's a living debate that we can have. I don't need to change the Constitution to prove the point one way or the other. Jefferson was, by nature, a reformer, and he was a thinker, and he was always asking, how can we do this better? So Jefferson was certainly my inspiration, and I think he would be the inspiration for many others if they were to tackle constitutional reform. Jefferson had no fear of change. He had no fear of the future. He welcomed it in many respects because he knew that society would be better in a hundred years than the one he saw in his own time. In 1796, I think it was, uh, Jefferson became the Vice President of the United States, having served as Secretary of State under uh, George Washington's administration. And uh, his principal function, if you look at Article 1, Section 3, I believe, the only prescribed duty for the Vice President of the United States is presiding over the United States Senate. In the course of the time, he wrote a parliamentary manual for the rules of the Senate, and to some extent, the House. Those rules still persist today. I think the Founding Fathers very wisely devised the Senate and let each state be equal in terms of two for each state. You know, you've read the story, I'm sure, of, and it's a factually true story of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson when he returned from France. Jefferson, who was not part of the Constitutional Convention, queried Washington as to why they had a Senate. What was the purpose of the Senate? And Washington said, well, you've just answered the question. He said, what do you mean? He said, you took your hot coffee and poured it into the saucer.
The Senate is a saucer to cool down the rhetoric and the thinking and the intemperance of what we call respectfully the other body, the House of Representatives. People are fascinated by the operation of the United States Senate because really it's an anti-democratic institution, small d democratic. Uh, every state has two senators and even in the founders time some states were much more highly populated than others. The highest populated state was 13 times the size of the least populated state. Today the ratio is not 13 to 1, it's 70 to 1. California has 70 times the population of Wyoming. If you put together all of the small states and you look at their populations with two senators per state, it takes exactly 17 percent of the population of the United States to elect a majority of the United States Senate. Is that healthy? I mean, it's, it's okay to ask. The founders would have wanted us to ask. They were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. But if the tyranny of the majority is bad, isn't the opposite extreme also bad, which is the tyranny of the small minority? In my view, 17% is a small minority. A lot of what the federal government does is allocate tax money to the states. It will come as no surprise to people that the small states get far more than their due whether it's transportation money or education money or uh, farm subsidies, whatever it may be. What does that mean in practice? It means that the people who live in the large states are subsidizing the small states. Now, maybe that's a good thing or maybe it isn't, but we ought to think about it. We may not change them and under the current constitutional provision, it may well take a consensus of the states to change the Senate which means it will never happen because it would only take Wyoming to say no we want to have two senators just like California uh, there are ways to do it in a constitutional convention but it would be a difficult process to pull that off but my point is we ought to be thinking about these things the least that could happen is that people would finally understand the Senate and why it does what it does and why it is so contrarian and why it constantly stymies the interests of larger states and the heavy concentrations of American population. I believe that one of the real weaknesses of our political system is that we can't fire a president in midterm if we no longer have confidence in him or her. We can get rid of a criminal president through impeachment, though we've not, in fact, been able to do that, except possibly in the case of Richard Nixon, who resigned. If the commander-in-chief is incompetent, loses confidence in the country, we feel, well, we're just stuck with that person until the next election comes around. In most political systems around the world, there's a procedure for a vote of no confidence, which I think we need. I would be much more concerned with changing the way we elect the president because I think that's immediately dangerous. What are you afraid of? Count on the vote! Virtually all of your audience has lived through an example of the danger. This is a systemic flaw. It wasn't just a happenstance. But in 2000, the president of the United States took office. There was no pretense that we really wanted to know how the people of Florida had voted. Counts over. We're putting Bush in place. Well, why were they even able to do that? Because of the electoral college system. Uh, because who carried Florida determined the election. Um, if we had a president elected by popular vote, this simply wouldn't happen. Um, and we would never have a president who took office uh, with uh, fewer votes than another candidate. That's indefensible. And you know, this nearly happened the other way in 2004. Kerry had carried Ohio. And that's just as wrong. The president should be elected by the people and at a minimum should be the candidate who gets more votes than everybody else. But he certainly shouldn't be the number two finisher. You know, think about it for a minute. How could that be? The United States has the most difficult to amend constitution in the entire world. People might remember that it takes two-thirds of each House of Congress and the quarters of the states. This means that in order to win what I call the amendment game, 
you have to get 67 votes in the Senate, whatever two-thirds of 435 is in the House, plus a minimum of 75 state legislative houses. That's if you want to change the Constitution. There have been 9,000 amendments submitted to Congress. Most of them should have been killed, but should virtually all of them have been killed without submitting to the states for ratification? There were a lot of good ideas in there. Maybe they were a relative handful compared to the bad ideas, but Congress has been very stingy in submitting proposals and amendments to the states for ratification. I went back and checked uh, from the time I entered the Senate in 1968 until I left in 1996, and I think there were 35 or 40 attempts to amend the Constitution. I supported D.C. statehood, which didn't make it. It was only ratified by, I think, 16 of the required 38 states. You can go down the list. Balanced budget amendment, voluntary prayer in school, line item veto, abortion rights. Some of those things I think should happen. Others, I just assumed they didn't happen. One of the first pieces of legislation I worked on was the, the voting bill, uh, the, the amendment in 78 uh, for the D.C. residents to get the vote. And it went through the, you know, it was just fascinating to be that close to it and watch this process unfold. The negotiations and the arguments and the threats and all that just to get it out of the Congress. <laughs> and then you're sending it to 50 state legislatures, all of whom have a very different perspective and understanding of the District of Columbia. And it ain't happening. <laughs> the states are like, oh, I don't think so. And so you don't get your number. But that's the process. We tried to get an Equal Rights Amendment put into the Constitution because if you take a close look at it, you know, women were almost left out. We got the 19th Amendment to vote. I worked on the Equal Rights Amendment when I was in Congress. It had taken from the time from 1923 to 1972 for it to come to the Congress for discussion. We haven't excluded people because of race. We, we had an amendment that stopped that. But let's stop excluding and discriminating against women because of gender and let's put it in the Constitution. Had it passed, it would have been a great step forward for human rights and I think for relations between men and women in this country, but it failed. I guess the procedure, at least from my knowledge, seems to be okay. Uh, everybody has to say, everybody has a chance to say yes or no. The founders wanted to see some limitations on Congress. So in Article 5 they provided us with a second means of amendment. And really for many of the founders it was the preferred means of amendment. It was to provide the states with direct access to changing the Constitution. Uh, 34 states under our current system of 50 states can request that the Congress call a constitutional convention. Congress has no leeway. It must call a constitutional convention. And it really has no role in that constitutional convention. That's up to the states. So the constitutional convention becomes the preeminent authority, not Congress. You could never get and into gerrymandering, the distortion of districts that favor the incumbents through Congress. Of course they would never agree to that because it would threaten their re-elections. The only way we'll ever end gerrymandering really is through a constitutional convention when individual delegates representing the states can take over the process and submit amendments to the 50 states asking 38 of them to ratify. And the census of 2000 identified 4.1 million Native Americans and Alaskan Natives. Are you looking at the Constitution? Uh, do you see 1.4 percent of our people represented? There needs to be some mechanism that can ensure that the representative government is representative of all the people within the government. Objective redistricting would accomplish that. I think it's time for another convention. You know, the, the basics still remain sound, but I think we need to take another look.
One of the things I fear about having a constitutional convention in a time of crisis is that the momentary concerns, understandable momentary concerns about national security, will pressure people, persuade them to make massive changes in the basic structure that would compromise individual rights and equality rights and expand the power of the executive uh, for the future, not just for this temporary passing crisis. I have an innate fear of constitutional conventions because I've always thought that if we call a constitutional convention, let's say to rewrite the Second Amendment, that the rewriters wouldn't stop there and they'd rewrite something that I think is absolutely perfect and change it to something that was harmful and bad. So flawed as it may be, I'm willing to have it stay as is until I can ha hear a convincing argument that will change only this bad thing or only make this unclear thing more clear than it is now, and we won't do anything else. If I could have that assurance, I'd say go ahead. People forget that a constitutional convention is not the final word. The states are always the final word. Every single word change of the Constitution coming out of a constitutional convention must be submitted to the 50 states, and 38 states must approve. How many Democratic blue states are there? There are 18. How many Republican red states are there? There are 24, the other states being competitive in purple. Well, if the Democratic states hang together as they would to defeat any conservative change, nothing will be ratified. If the 24 Republican states stay together to defeat any liberal change, nothing from the left will be ratified. So much of the fear that people have about a runaway convention is just insane. It's absolutely untrue. It's not justified by the facts. It is our fear of the future and it has become our fear of one another. I'd much rather have somebody look me in the eye and say, you know, I think we have a terrific constitution. I think the Electoral College is great. I like the Senate and the unequal representation. So everything you think is a weakness, I think is a strength. I'd obviously disagree with that person, but I'd rather have somebody tell me that than say, you know, I think you're probably right. You really have identified a lot of weaknesses in our political structure. But you know, I just don't have enough faith in my fellow Americans that they're capable of being as temperate and rational as you and I are. I think a constitutional convention is inevitable at some point. When that point will be, no one can say. It may be after a crisis, uh, maybe a, a very unsuccessful uh, foreign war or a terrible depression. There may be something that triggers a re-examination of American society. But we hope the American Republic goes on forever, for centuries and centuries. And at some point, the system, frankly, is going to deteriorate enough so that uh, intelligent citizens will demand a new convention. The President of the United States believes that he had the power to go into the war with Iraq on the basis of being the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Now, anybody that's studied American history and American constitutional history knows that's a ridiculous claim. But does the public? So when Congress doesn't push back and say, no, you don't, you just can't commit troops to this, is anybody telling the Congress, push back? This is a decision about war. We, maybe we should go to war. Maybe that's okay. But we should have a debate. This is the most critical decision a president or a country can ever make, committing our young people to potential injury and to killing others as well. You have to have a declaration of war. The last declaration of war was World War II. And our troops have been engaged many times depending on the intensity of the conflict. And the Congress has never seen fit to uh, declare war since. Why is a question I can't answer.
I remember Ronald Reagan was telling me one time, uh, there's that phone by your bed, and it rings at four o'clock in the morning. And the voice in a very calm way is in the command center of the Department of Defense or the White House or the various areas and say, now, Mr. President, this is the situation. There's so many Americans about to be taken hostage. Our military is poised to take actions to do the rescue. But I must tell you, Mr. President, to do this rescue will have to involve the violation of the sovereign rights of nations, overflight, or whatever the case may be. What's the decision, Mr. President? He's got to make that decision. There's no time for the president to sit down and assemble a whole group of people. It's pretty clear to me that the two terms of George Bush have been an assault on the Constitution. We see it in the treatment of prisoners. We see it in the rules about wiretapping. We see it in a just narrowing of the freedoms we all enjoy. And unless we correct these or beat them back, uh, we're going to live in a different America than we thought we were living in. And it's surprising to me how few people are alarmed about this because I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, a conservative, a liberal, or don't care at all about these things. This affects you. And you need to be on the alert about it and you need to say stop. I want a constitution that speaks to everybody. I want a constitution that protects freedom for everybody. I want a constitution that protects my right to ask questions. I think people aren't alarmed for a variety of reasons. First, the specter of terrorism has terrified many of us. I mean, the 9-11 was such a devastating blow to not only our persons, but to our psyche, that we could be attacked in this way. And it made some of us say, well, I'll do anything to make sure something like that never happens again. And if allowing the government to listen in on my telephone calls is a way to stop that from happening, uh, then that's okay, but that's not okay. I don't want the government listening on, on my telephone calls uh, unless they have some probable cause to do so, unless I'm about to commit some crime and they know about it. No, don't listen to my telephone calls. These are my telephone calls. These are my words I speak. And you have no right to limit any of that, ever. Mr. President, <laughs> you're either right or you're wrong. Where's the problem here? I don't get it. Where's the problem? All these people are so upset about his interpretation, then sue him. Then say, you know what? It's a cause of action that says you're wrong. And I have standing because I'm a U.S. citizen. And run it through the process. You don't get to skip over the Supreme Court and make an independent assessment of the president's judgment and interpretation of the Constitution legally. You can do it vocally. You can protest it. You can do all of that because the Constitution lets you do that. But to change the process, to change the interpretation, you've got to bring that cause before the court. And the court will weigh it against the Constitution and will either side with you or against you. Or just kick it back and say you don't have standing in the first place. The notion of the Bill of Rights as the great protector of the American individual rights is a modern idea, not part of our constitutional history. Just to make this point, because I just love it. In 1798, we passed the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act, which John Adams signed, and his biographer, David McCollum, called it the worst act of his entire presidency, made it a crime to criticize the government and the president. A crime. And they prosecuted people. Where was the court with the First Amendment? They were saying, well, we don't have any role in that. To show you how political this was, it was not a crime to criticize the vice president. And why not? Thomas Jefferson was the vice president, and they wanted to criticize him like crazy. They couldn't wait to keep criticizing him. So you could criticize Jefferson and, the, you know, and his uh, what, Republican Democratic Party, but you couldn't criticize the Federalist Party, and it was a crime. So the Bill of Rights is a latecomer in its enforcement, it's the 1950s.
Sometimes over the course of history in a particular period, it's two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes it's two steps backwards and one step forward. We are right now in one of the recurring periods when uh, we are in a national security crisis, when people are understandably concerned about whether the safety of the nation is jeopardized and at every single such period. We see government reacting the same way. The executive branch overreacts, unnecessarily expands its own power, reduces the rights of individuals, including freedom of speech, and then there's a corrective mechanism that sets in. And by the way, this is not a partisan issue. It's really an issue among the branches of government. I mean, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a human rights hero in many respects, and yet he was responsible for the internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans. So I think we have to expect from history that no matter what the president's values might be in another context, when the security of the nation seems to be in danger, we can expect the executive branch to extend its power to the maximum. And that makes it more important for the checks and balances to come into play, for Congress to exercise a vigorous oversight role, uh, for the courts to vigorously exercise judicial review, for public groups such as the ACLU and others to act as watchdogs, for the press uh, to act as a watchdog. But if you look at the course of history, you have every basis for optimism that a correction will come into play. Ours is a simple, fundamental document, and as John Marshall once put it in a case, it's meant to survive the crises of generations, to survive over time. Now to do that requires interpretation. Many of the Constitution's most important phrases are really quite general. Due process of law, equal protection of the law cruel and unusual punishment. These are not self-explanatory words. They, they require someone to interpret them and give them meaning. And I think in a very real sense, the Constitution was meant to be not a static document, not for one moment in time, but meant to be an organic document, rather like the English common law. I think the framers were influenced by the sense of law as something which develops and takes on meaning from one generation to another. Madison and Jefferson in their correspondence were very fond of the phrase, the earth belongs always to the living generation. And if one takes that seriously, and certainly they did, then it would mean that the Constitution ought not to be seen to be the Ark of the Covenant somehow to be worshiped and never to be changed, but that as it shouldn't be just easily changed, it is fundamental law. It's not an ordinary statute, it's not in the code and therefore it shouldn't just be subject to alteration by legislative majorities, but where change is clearly uh, indicated, then it ought to come about. One of the most significant declines in the nation over the last 30 years has been Americans' understanding of their Constitution. It's remarkable how little anybody knows about it. Both Ronald Reagan and Derek Bach, the president of Harvard, within a five or six year period said that we are losing our relationship to the Constitution. The Constitution guarantees freedom, and some people interpret that freedom as to do nothing and pay no attention to anything. So that's one end of the spectrum. But I hope that young people are guided and drawn to this magnificent document.
understanding the Constitution and understanding the concept of rule of law in general is central to understanding who we are as a nation. We look to the law uh, to solve eventually our problems. It doesn't mean our issues. It doesn't mean that we may agree with the solutions, but we do agree as Americans that the Constitution provides the framework for solving those issues. I think it is so important to have our nation's young citizens and future voters and candidates and Supreme Court justices um, learn about the Constitution very early and I love the idea of presenting it to them as a work in progress, which it is. Even if it is not subject to a complete overhaul through the Constitutional Convention process, it's always subject to the amendment process, it's always subject to the interpretation process, it's always subject to implementation and enforcement, or to non-implementation and non-enforcement. And James Madison said at the beginning that it's only worth the paper that it's written on unless there are actual people who understand what their constitutional rights are and are willing to stand up and demand that government officials respect their rights. And the Constitution is not self-executing. We know Senator Robert Byrd from West Virginia carries a copy round in his pocket and uh, I think that's good advice to everybody. Carry a copy around in your pocket and uh, look at it every now and then and see what it says and remind yourself of how precious it is. Major funding for Questioning the Constitution was provided by Paul and Victoria Saunders and by J. Thornton Kirby. Questioning the Constitution was produced in collaboration with the University of Virginia's Center for Politics.